you all are having entirely too much fun. I don't know whether this is a college homecoming planning committee meeting uh, with beer uh, or if uh, everybody is actually here to uh, learn about this important subject. But I'm delighted that we have such a huge crowd this afternoon. I want to wish you a warm welcome and say how gratifying it is to see so many subject matter experts, people that uh, I recognize and that our guests recognize in the audience that uh, uh, truly have a lot of expertise uh, on this issue of Central American security. My name is Steve Johnson. I'm director of the Americas program here at CSIS. I'm the guy that gets up and, and tells you that uh, we'd like to have you put your cell phones uh, on uh, stun or thrill mode uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation. And uh, also the person who uh, says that uh, when it comes time for the questions and answers, uh, that uh, we would like you to identify yourself and also your organization before your uh, question and, and try to keep them, since there's a lot of people here that will want to uh, have interface with our guests, if you would uh, keep your questions fairly short or if you're prone to commentary to keep that also short. Um, Six years ago, it was novel to see the Central American ambassadors in one room coordinating their lobbying efforts on the Capitol on the DR-CAFTA trade agreements. And now it is equally impressive to see the national leaders of these countries coordinating security policies and reaching out to Mexico and Colombia to mesh efforts in fighting transnational criminal organizations, drug traffickers, and gangs. Not only is our featured speaker uh, uh, and featured guests, the leader of a pioneering organization that has grown in confidence and competency since its birth in 1991. But I'm pleased to note that Assistant Secretary General of, of the Organization of American States, Albert Ramden, is also with us this afternoon. And he's right here in, in, in the front row, and I'd like to say that as a former representative of the Caribbean community who knows a thing or two, about cooperation, he's been especially supportive of the SICA process and instrumental in helping the two sub-regions, the Caribbean and Central America, strengthen their relations. So really want to thank you very much uh, for your presence here, uh, Mr. Secretary General, for uh, being with us. I also see that uh, we have uh, um, Ambassador Francisco Altschul of El Salvador with us want to recognize him. And also Ambassador Francisco Campbell Hooker of Nicaragua is, is with us as well. And I hope I haven't missed, missed anybody uh, in that group. And of course, we're glad to have all of you with us. And when I was a military attache in Central America a long time ago, and, and Diana Negroponte remembers this, uh, she sort of took me under her wing uh, at that time. Right, kept me on the straight and narrow. You probably remember that drug trafficking and criminality was barely on the radar screen. People are, were aware of the problems, but the East-West conflict looms so large over all policy matters that it wasn't until the 1990s that lawmakers and senior leaders began to really take notice. Now these problems stand taller as threats almost than conflicts between states. I could go on in this fashion, but the real experts this afternoon have yet to speak. And here to introduce our main speaker and invited guest is one of them, my good friend and colleague, Eric Farnsworth, Vice President of the Council of the Americas and America's Society. Eric, the podium is yours. Well, thank you very much, Steve. We are a mutual admiration society because I could go on about you and CSIS and the terrific job that you and your colleagues do here. It is a real privilege uh, for the Council of the Americas and me personally to uh, join with CSIS for what we anticipate is going to be a very timely and important program. And we're very pleased to have the opportunity to continue to bring some focus and hopefully some clarity as well to this topic today. It's also a privilege to join such a distinguished and knowledgeable group of speakers this afternoon for our discussions. We've assembled, we believe, a very top group and we look forward to their insights as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Central America is at a dangerous crossroads. 
That's a direct quote from a report that was just issued on uh, late last week by the U.S. Senate Caucus on International Narcotics Control. And it's a report that was issued, in fact, just as leaders from the region, including our own Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and also our keynote speaker today, were meeting in New York as a follow-up to their June meeting in Guatemala, which discussed the Central American security strategy, which most, if not all of you, are very familiar with already. And indeed, in my view, Central America is at a dangerous crossroads, an inflection point, if you will. And the high-level attention that is now focusing on the region and on these, issue, on a, these issues is an important signal that regional governments and also friends of the region are taking these issues quite seriously. Led by State Department Assistant Secretary Bill Brownfield, whom CSIS and the Council of the Americas and other organizations were honored to jointly host in August, the U.S. government has developed a new, more comprehensive strategy to address the deteriorating situation in the region. The government has pledged some $300 million in new and reprogrammed funds, and others, including the World Bank and the IDB, have plussed that up, great government expression, plussed that up, to around $1 billion. That's not an insignificant sum, particularly at a time of budget constraints. As we've seen from the Mexico experience with the Merida Initiative, however, it takes time for funds to be obligated, equipment to be procured, personnel to be trained, and unforeseen challenges to be overcome. And in the meantime, a region of great policy interest to the United States historically is being challenged in some ways to its very core. The institutions of mostly young, fragile democracies are being hollowed out, corrupted by drug traffickers and the Allies impunity is rampant, and the police and security forces in several countries have been penetrated by the drug gangs. Even as the hemisphere has just celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, the health of democracy in Central America and the ability of democracy to deliver a better life for its citizens is increasingly uncertain. More can and should be done. Creative thinking to address a common threat is required. From the United States, in addition to the very positive steps that were agreed by regional leaders, we can reduce the demand for drugs at home and the supply of weapons and money that go abroad. We can begin to link illegal drug use publicly to death and destruction in Central America and the broader region, much as the Blood Diamond and Conflict Minerals campaigns have effectively done in parts of Africa. In the interim time period it takes to, produce new, to procure new material for Central America, we can consider the transfer of excess equipment as appropriate from the downsizing of the effort in Iraq, where, according to press reports, a mad dash is now underway to expose of excess stocks. Other steps could also be considered. Of course, the region, too, has obligations, not the least of which is raising additional resources on its own behalf. Most importantly, the region must begin to think and act regionally, as Steve was alluding to in his comments, to improve coordination and effectiveness, create economies of scale, and reduce the ability of the drug traffickers and illegal gangs to arbitrage the institutions of governance between individual nations in a bid to exploit weaknesses wherever they may exist. Clearly, ladies and gentlemen, the challenge before us collectively is immense. Nobody should underestimate the effort that will be required. But if we work together with purpose and resolve, I believe we'll be able to address the issues effectively and successfully. And that is precisely why we are so pleased to have with us this afternoon our keynote speaker, Juan Aleman Gurdian, the Secretary General of the Central American Integration System, or SICA. The Secretary General has enjoyed a long and successful career in the private sector, and he's also held senior positions in national government. He's a visionary. He is one of those who played an important role in the development of the SICA concept and the organization now finds itself at the very nexus of regional efforts to reduce violence and to restore confidence. The Secretary General has proven to be an effective leader as the meetings in Guatemala and New York, which I previously mentioned, can attest. And so we are very pleased that in the midst of his consultations here in Washington, the Secretary General has indeed carved out a bit of his time to be able to join us today to bring important perspective and understanding to this discussion this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming the Secretary General of SICA, Dr. Juan Aleman Gurdian.
Excellencies, Ambassadors of SICA, and other members of the diplomatic corps, high-level U.S. government officials, distinguished panelists, other public and private sector officials, invitees and friends from the press. It is a duty for us in Central America to take advantage of this excellent opportunity to present our message on the topic outlined in the title of this encounter, a greater regional response to criminal activities in Central America, which in our opinion is very important to all of us. I would like to thank the joint sponsorship of the Center of Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, and the Council for, the, of the, of, for this America, of these Americas for sponsoring this event and CSIS for making it possible. We are especially grateful to our good friends, Eric and Stephen and Michael, in order, in, in order to make the best of, this, of the time and listen to our distinguished panelists and uh, the audiences, I will proceed immediately to establish why the Central American security dilemma requires a greater regional response and why the USA must lead the proceed and, as it has. Um, with your permission, we are going to have a video immediately and then I will continue uh, my remarks. Please. At the end of the decade of the 80s, the Central American presidents subscribed the Tegucigalpa Protocol with the purpose of resolving, through dialogue and negotiation, the political military conflicts faced by some countries in the region. This was the procedure meant to establish firm and lasting peace in the region. Countries in conflict began a process of voluntary disarmament and reduction of their military forces, which led to the strengthening of a climate of trust and security. Central Americans then began to engage in the moral and material reconstruction of their societies. The Central American region started to make headway towards a climate of peace, freedom, democracy, and development, where regional security seemed to be assured. Nevertheless, economic challenges and natural disasters have shaped the region in these past two decades. To date, there has been partial success in the region but there is still work to be done to rebuild the social and economic fabric, so weakened after many years of violence that left a legacy of massive migration, family breakdown, absence of values, and a lack of respect towards life. Additional to these hardships, one must consider that the privileged and strategic geographic location of Central America represents a factor which, while providing great opportunities for development, has also become its greatest liability. The Central American Isthmus is a contact point between North and South, East and West. Unfortunately, it also bridges the biggest drug producers and consumers in the world. As a result, Central America today is facing a crossroads. Highly organized criminal groups, whose sophistication and armament continuously becomes more technical, engage in a growing number of illegal activities, among which the most prominent are drug trafficking by land, sea, and air routes, smuggling of chemical precursors, money laundering, smuggling and trafficking in persons, as well as trafficking of small and light weapons. Likewise, gang activity mainly affects young people in the region. Other equally serious problems that affect the population are the kidnapping, extortion, robbery, and vehicle theft industries, among others. There are several factors enabling the activities of criminal groups in Central American countries, including, among others, the weaknesses within the security and justice systems, as well as the deficiencies in investigative capacity and criminal intelligence, all of which have led to the fast spreading of the problem. As Central Americans, we are concerned and aware of the fact that all of the efforts we have put forth to promote security 
have a significant impact on social investment, since the resources which should be allocated to health, education, and the improvement of the population's standard of living need to be redirected to issues related to security. Within this context, in Central America, we are facing the following dilemma, security or welfare. Thus, we believe it is necessary to establish improved levels of coordination and cooperation within the local, national, regional, and international context. Today, more than ever, we must intensify the battle, not only in countries that produce illegal drugs, but also in countries where there is consumption of the drugs that traverse our territory. For this reason, it is vital that on the basis of the principle of shared responsibility, we assume a solidary commitment in the fight against organized crime through the broad and sustained support from allied and partner countries, as well as from international organizations. Central America has made efforts and sacrifices to provide a significant contribution to regional, hemispheric, and international security, but its capacities have been overwhelmed by the magnitude of this phenomenon. The numbers clearly demonstrate that this is the case. Over 43 million people living in Central America have engaged in the task of promoting a vast citizens movement against violence and insecurity. In response to this social outcry, the governments of SICA countries have agreed on a security strategy, which includes a milestone of great magnitude to address the problems of violence, lack of citizen security, and organized crime. The Central American Security Strategy outlines the components and activities necessary to strengthen the security of the people of Central America and their assets, thus allowing our population to meet the objectives of human development. It also strives to integrate the multiple efforts existing in the region to promote security in order to harmonize them and to manage material, financial, technological, and human resources that are demanded by the institutions in charge of protecting and contributing to security. Nevertheless, this strategy and its plan of action require adequate resources for their implementation, additional to those that each country of the region already contributes. Therefore, it is urgent to count with the political, technical, and financial support of the international community. The international cooperation annually disperses funds to citizen security programs in Central America. These amounts represent between 2.5 and 4 percent of the total costs that the governments of the region have to invest in citizen security. In other words, the international cooperation provides one out of every 40 dollars provided by the states of the region. A large part of this international contribution is earmarked for justice and violence prevention programs for at-risk populations, and very little of it goes to the components of crime fighting, penitentiary centers, and institutional strengthening. Two-thirds of these contributions are channeled through national states, and the rest is allocated to local governments, NGOs, and universities. Only 1% of the cooperation is channeled through regional institutional agencies. The Central American Integration System in compliance with the mandates of the heads of state, is managing the international support provided for the implementation of the Central American Security Strategy. The joint efforts of SICA, supporting countries, and international organizations led to a process of consultations and meetings, as well as to technical and political work to facilitate the organization of the first international conference for the support to the Central American Security Strategy. This international conference consolidates a substantial political commitment at the highest level between Central America and the international community on the basis of the principle of shared responsibility, laying the groundwork for a solid and sustainable foundation of cooperation to address the needs for a secure, peaceful, democratic, free and developed Central America. The first international conference for the support of the Central American Security Strategy coincides with a momentous time in the life of the region. The thousands of lives that are lost every year, including those of young persons and children, women and the elderly, who are victims of violence on our streets and cities, are a tragic reminder of the seriousness of this threat. 
the rise in violence and criminality indices is yielding terrible economic, political, and social consequences for our peoples and threatens to worsen if these trends are not reverted soon. This is why the Central American governments, with the support of the international community, have prepared a regional, comprehensive, and coordinated response. This response has been called the Central American Security Strategy. This initiative is a firm step in the fight by SICA countries against organized crime and violence. All decisions adopted shall define the future of Central America. That is to say, a legal or illegal Central America. A Central America living in peace or a violent Central America. An authoritarian Central America or a democratic Central America. There is no time to lose. We must ensure the success of this fight and become a Central America that lives in peace, freedom, democracy, and development. Thank you. Central American is comprised of seven countries, Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. The region has an estimated area of uh, 523,000 square kilometer, kilometers, and its coastline extends from, for more than 5,600 square kilometers. Central America has a population of almost 48 million inhabitants, of which 59% reside in urban are areas. It is also in areas prone Thank you. To natural disaster, which have increased in recent years and drained public sector resources from governments. The unique geographic locations of Central America put it in a peculiar situations. On one side, it provides tremendous opportunity for development and global integration. On the other hand, it makes it very vulnerable. The isthmus is the point of the contact between the north and the south of the continent, between east and west, the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, but it also the route used for transnational organized crime to other illicit markets, as I will elaborate further on. Almost since the signing of the Tegucigalpa Protocol, to the Organization of Central American States in 1991, which established the Central American Integration System, Central America has had its own regional security model based on a regional balance of power, the strengthening of civil society, a focus on uh, elevations of extreme poverty, the promotion of sustainable development, the eradication of violence, corruption, terrorism, drug, drug trafficking, and arms trafficking. This model has been encompassed and instituted into the Framework Treaty on the Democratic Security signed in December 1995, which is the legal instrument that establishes principles from the democratic security perspective. The security situation in Central America is characterized by problems related to transnational organized crime, which, which represents structural and geographic challenges, including drug traffics, trafficking organizations that have mani managed the extent their outreach of influence to different regions in the American continent and have penetrated through our borders. Today, Organized crime is multidimensional. Alpha drug trafficking is the principal activity. It is not the only one. It has become a major problem that pro Central American presents a, di a di diversification of their illicit activities, ranging from drug trafficking, human trafficking, treatment of persons, extortions, arms trafficking, violent crime, money to launder, 
and, and forgery of documents, among, on, among others. The drug trafficking organization penetrations process in other latitudes has three origins. The transnationalization of the organized crime phenomenon, which impacts other territories, the necessity to extend their outreach of influence to other countries in order to facilitate the transit and delivery of drugs as a way to ensure income from drug trafficking. And finally, the complementary characteristic of criminal organization in the region. All thought, this is a basically an extra regional phenomenon in the sense that productions and consumptions are mostly non-regional. The trafficking of drugs carries several grave treats for Central American security, securities as follows. The high rates of murders and other violent crime that affect our territories. The local consumption of drugs, which facilitates or induce the causes of sen senseless crime. The introduction of non-narco forms of organized crime, public and private sectors corruption, as well as money laundering. The commitment of additional resources towards this struggle, which should be devoted to economic and social investment, the treat against democratic and institutional stabilities and values the destruction of social cohesion and the produ productive sectors of our nation. The region has be become an air, mar maritime, and land corridor for the transit of drugs, one of the principal routes used by organized crime for the trafficking of drugs from the south destined to the north of the continent. Also, it is not worth worthy the increased consumption at an alarming pace encouraged often by the same drug traffickers who pay for their local services in kind with, with illicit drugs. From the qualitative perspective, it has also been observed that Central American region is used for trafficking of cocaine and on a smaller scale of heroin. New trend drugs trafficking of cocaine are being developed and used, such as uh, semi-submergible submarines, which have many capabilities because of their ability to maneuver without the difficulties of being detected by radars or infrared lights. Regarding the loss of human life, the situation is very serious. For example, in 2010, and according to the United Nations Program for Development, UNDP, there were over 18,000 homicides in Central America, with, with which represent an average, average of 42 homicides per 100,000 person, a rate similar on the superior contemporary, contemporary armed conflicts. In other alarming aspects of our security situation in the region is related juvenile violence related to gangs called maras, with links with counterparts in the US and themselves interconnected regionally. The phenomenon has become in recent years more complex and, uh, and diverse. According to various resources, the total number of GAN members in Central America is est estimated at 70,000. GANs are much more numerous in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, while the rest of Central American countries are not immune to this risk. Such high levels of insecurity also increase the probability of potential loss of foreign and local investors confidence which decrease, decreases the possibility of regional development. At the micro level, insecurity affects differently the various so social categories, social labor and man man managerial sectors. It limits product, 
productive benefits and social capital. On the other hand, private sector investment in areas of security system and private securities at the location of their companies increases the cost of production and affects the competitiveness of the Central American products on the international markets. Add to this is the criminal practices of money laundering in Central America, originated outside of the region. These source resources distort economic policies and the economies themselves. In addition, they, gener they generate corruption and discourage investment from genuine sources with the potentials to invest. One consequence of this situation is the unstoppable migration of Central Americans to the North or to the other Central American countries, which offers better, better economic conditions and in pursuit of peace and opportunities that are not found in their countries of origin. Despite the negative impact of crime in Central America, economic activities is strong and the eco economies are growing propelled by economic integration and a dynamic intra-regional trade. Intra-regional trade among the five member countries of the so-called Central American Common Market increased in 2010 by 10% and reached the six mil billions dollars. The gross domestic product grew in the region by 3.2% and add um, 125 billion dollars. Tourism is again, again increasing, with tourists returning to the region, having become many of their purchases of Central American exports. There are many North American companies that contribute to the regional progress. Likewise, there are thousands of North American citizens who in some form or another have social and cultural ties or choose to retire in our region. The increasingly transnational nature of orga organized crime in activities makes it indispensable and necessary to strengthen and enhance cooperation in the area of security in our region. In April of this year, the Central American Integration System through the Central American Security Commission, comprised of Vice Minister responsible for public security, defense, and foreign affairs, adopted a strategy that was revi revised and updated and, pri and prioritized. This strategy seeks to contribute to the safeguarding of human security in the region and in achieving the objectives of the model of and framework, framework work on the trade Treaty on Democracy Security. Involved in the design and implementation are government officials responsible for the prevention and combating of crimes, representatives from the group of friends, researchers and specialists in the field, senior representatives from the economic, political and financial uh, spheres, experts with, in, uh, with international visions, and of course representatives from the civil society, including the business sector. The security strategy aims to establish general components and activities need to strengthen the security of its people and their private property in Central America that allows our communities to achieve their human development co goals. The specific objectives consist of the following. Integrate various efforts by the region on security matters with the objectives to harmonize and achieve the better results, to facilitate coordination, exchange of uh, information and experiences between the various national actors and agency in the region to effectively combat regional criminal activities, identify and manage financial needs and resources as well as training which are required by the institutions responsible for securities. Design and agree on a common position of intervention 
on the most important public safety use in the region. This strategy is not the legal instrument. Excuse me. This strategy is the legal instrument from a, a holistic perspective, aimed to guide the coordinate uh, the coordination actions on securities undertaken by countries in the region within their respective jurisdictions. The comprehensive and inclusive nature of the strategies is reflected in four components. Law enforcement, prevention of violence, rehabilitation, reintegration, and, and prison management, and institutional statening. In June, of this year, the International Conference in support of the Central American Security Strategy was held along with the participation of more than 57 delegations, which include friendly countries, Central American highness level officials, international organizations like the World Bank and the Inter-American Bank and CABI, CABE, the European Union, United Nations, and the Organization of the American States the private sectors, and other Central American civil society sectors, all members of SICA's consultative com committee, committee and the media. The international conference aimed to consolidate a substantially political commitment at the highest level between among the international community and Central America to the concept of demo democratic security under the principle of shared and differentiated responsibility and the additionality of financial resources on the regional base, basis to, to the one already is available at the national level while establishing solid and sustainable cooperation to address the needs of more secure, peaceful, democratic, and developed Central America. The SICA member states are currently in the phase of transforming regional priorities into projects, regional projects, with their respective inputs, process, actions, benefits, and outcomes. The design of the projects derived from the Central American security strategy, considerations calls for a series of, of political and technical intervention that are already taking place. During the first phase, we are working at the technical level with delegations from the Central American countries to outline their priorities and establish the base and scope of each project, and hence the initial phases of the project's consolidation process will be completed. In the second phase, we will meet with the countries and multilateral agencies based on the projects that were chosen to be implemented. It is expected that this phase of the design, designing of the post-conference regional projects be completed in December this year for at least some of the 20 regional projects to start at the beginning of 2012. Final considerations. In closing, within an, uh, our approach to security, challenges will not exhaust it nor discourage our convictions. We will address as much as we can the root causes and structural uses through institutional, economic, and social development in accordance with our democratic security model. The Central American security strategy represents a valuable contribution towards this, the search for holistic solutions and exemplary regional coordination effort. It is obvious that the resources and other means to face this scourge are limited to the countries of the region. This is a phenomenon with an unusual characteristic featuring actors who are integrated integrated in well-structured and disciplined criminal organization with increasing level of specialization to influence the institutions of their citizens. These transnational crime organizations act in accordance with the present 
mindset of globalization with command of the most sophisticated technologies with little roots in, in the territory, but sophisticated in management of illicit financial flows. With the evolution of this criminal phenomenon, a global and well-articulated approach is needed in all the countries of the region and henceforth requires the continuous support and commitment from the international community. The United States of America, through the direct and in, in, in interagency coordination effort of the, the State Department, has assumed a leadership position in the so-called group of friends of Central American security, security Strategy. Without the leaderships exercised by the US, US, the work done so far will not have been an, as effective as it is. It has. As close as last Friday, Secretary Clinton organized a meeting of the group of friends with the Central American Foreign Affairs Minister and high-level officials, the seven of its character and most successful one. The series of meetings held follow-up efforts and maintain the interest and commitment while the projects are being developed. We encourage all of you distinguished participants to support such efforts from your specific trench. Do, do it for self-interest or solidarity, but by all means, do it. The future is for all of us to conquer. It could be bright or it could be dark, depending in how we approach it. We most understand that in this non-Norway days small globe, we share a neighbor's small parcel which in for to project to protect and enhance for the benefit of present and future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General uh, Aleman. Uh, I think that uh, leaves uh, quite a bit of room uh, for questions as to how all of this is uh, going to function and how uh, these negotiations will be uh, translated in, into action uh, among these uh, countries that have uh, very different uh, cultures and very different uh, uh, legal statutes and, and, and ways of handling, handling crime. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce our discussants, and in the interest of time, I would uh, ask you to take a look at the biographies that uh, uh, are provided for you. Um, we have a very distinguished panel today. We have Deputy Chief of Mission from the uh, Embassy of Mexico, Mabel Gomez. Thank you for being with us. A Minister Counselor from the Embassy of uh, Colombia, who has ample experience also in Colombia's defense minister and knows these issues uh, in uh, the South American uh, sense, Vicente Echandia. And uh, also today we're honored to have with us uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs uh, from the State Department, Todd D. Robinson, who will give us a, a little dose of uh, reality, I think, in terms of uh, what uh, the United States can do in, in all of this. Um, Mabel, I would like to call on you first, if you would. Thank you very much, Steve. And good afternoon to everybody. Um, even though I have only five to seven minutes to speak, I would like to start by uh, commending the CSIS and the Council of the Americas for organizing this event. I think that this is a very timely event to keep the momentum up uh, after the conference in Guatemala. Uh, momentum that we need uh, not only uh, to push forward the implementation of the projects that are going to be presented at the end of this year, but also to um, underscore to the international community the importance 
uh, of the situation in Central America and the need to work together, all countries, to uh, support the region against transnational organized crime. After having been said that, um, I've been asked to talk about what has Mexico done in support of Central America, what are we planning to assist with. So I will give you a little bit of background, then I will focus on what we are uh, putting on the table in terms of cooperation. And at the end, if I have enough time, Steve, I will uh, give some uh, highlights about what we think are key elements to ensure uh, success uh, of the strategy implemented in Central America. Well, in terms of background, uh, Mexico has been a, a strong advocate, I would say, uh, since the early 90s of uh, adopting multilateral and regional approaches to combat drug trafficking and more broadly um, transnational organized crime. Um, in this regard, during the current administration, since the very beginning, President Calderón uh, highlighted that strengthening international cooperation uh, on the basis of the principle that has been mentioned all along uh, today, the principle of shared responsibility, is one of the key components of the key dimensions of Mexico's security strategy. So uh, in that respect, as you all know, uh, Mexico has been cooperating uh, thoroughly with the United States. And of course, we have uh, reached out to our friends in Central America to, um, to strengthen our cooperation against transnational organized crime. In that respect, since uh, 2004, uh, we established uh, an institutional mechanism with Central America, Mexico and Central America, on democratic security. And in the context of that mechanism, uh, we have been uh, making joint efforts uh, to design a security strategy that was in fact adopted in 2007. In 2008, when we got together, um, uh, Central America and Mexico, uh, uh, we assess what has been done in terms of this regional strategy and we realized that there was uh, a need for concrete actions, so we had this idea of putting together a plan of action. This plan of action uh, was adopted uh, at the end of uh, 2008 uh, with the idea of implementing it in uh, a two-year uh, term. So it was a plan of action adopted for 2009 and 2010. Uh, in that context, we have been, uh, we, can, we have continued our dialogue with Central America in the context of this mechanism that I was talking about in the U.S., uh, I'm sorry, mexico um on dialogue on democratic security. In parallel, uh, you may know that the United States has also a U.S. SICA dialogue on democratic security. And we have been trying to uh, align those two separate mechanisms in order to have a better coordination between the two regions, North America and Central America. So this is one of the ideas that we have put uh, on the table uh, recently. And in fact, in December 2010, when the United States, uh, Canada, and Mexico got together in Wakefield, Canada, we, uh, Mexico uh, raised this issue in the context of the trilateral uh, ministerial meeting. And uh, finally, we got the US, Canada, and Mexico to agree that, uh, that it was important to engage with Central America with a view of creating a North America, Central America dialogue to strengthen regional cooperation and efforts against transnational organized crime. Uh, we have been committed in this regard because we think that it's important to prevent dispersion of efforts uh, on one side, North America, on the other side, Central America. We also think that it's important to prevent duplication of efforts, given the lack of resources. Uh, we think that we have to, uh, to maximize uh, our resources. So uh, that's why we are convinced that we have to prevent duplication of efforts. And also, uh, we are convinced that it's important to increase coordination uh, between uh, the governments and among the countries of each region in order to be more efficient and more effective in our actions, uh, coordinated actions against organized crime. So uh, this leads me to um, underscore 
the active participation that Mexico has had in the context of the core group of group of friends in support of uh, the Central American security <laughs> strategy. It was um, uh, the invitation that we got to participate in this group of friends was uh, pretty consistent with what we had been doing uh, towards Central America and with Central America. Uh, Central America, the Central American countries are not only our neighbors, they are our partners in several endeavors. So, um, and we are also pretty aware that um, combating transnational organized crime needs to be a joint effort, a regional effort, and uh, we will not be successful in Mexico without joint efforts coming from Central America. So we are together in this. If we fail in this regard, uh, it's not only a failure of Mexico, it will also be a failure of Central America and vice versa. So we have to uh, be uh, very um, uh, keen and, and pretty aware of, of this um, binomium that uh, is needed in the region. Now, in terms of what we are putting on the table uh, in terms of assistance and cooperation towards Central America, as Dr. Aleman has mentioned, uh, the Central American security strategy uh, has been um, designed with uh, four main components. Uh, just to remind you, uh, the component of combating crime, uh, the second one, rehabilitation, social insertion, and prisons, the third one, prevention of violence, and the fourth one, institutional uh, strengthening. And uh, under each of these four main components of the Central American strategy, and on the basis of expertise and uh, best practices in Mexico, uh, my country is offering uh, specific cooperation projects that are compatible at least with 15 of the 22 Central American profiles projects that uh, Central America has identified. Uh, those projects that uh, Mexico is offering focus on such specific priority areas that Mexico has uh, identified, such as combating transnational organized crime, and this touches upon uh, the, the cooperation needed at the border, uh, drug trafficking, of course, illicit arms trade, human trafficking, uh, institutional strengthening, and gangs. Uh, the content of the projects offered by Mexico consists of uh, four main cross-cutting cross themes. Um, and it's important to have this in mind because uh, all these projects are, are oriented, are aimed toward um, uh, underscoring the importance of these four uh, cross-cutting themes. And those are uh, the importance of vetting mechanisms, of adopting vetting mechanisms, uh, training, um, information exchange, and uh, lastly, strengthening of institutional capacities. So uh, finally, I will uh, leave time for your questions and I will be happy to, to answer those, but I finally would like to underscore the importance that Mexico deems to uh, vetting. Vetting, from our perspective, is essential uh, in order to put in place all cooperation actions. Why? Because we think that this is a, a, a major component uh, to ensure uh, a successful strategy and to ensure that cooperation is really uh, viable. So, in fact, Mexico is, uh, is uh, willing to offer its own methodology that we have um, developed in Mexico uh, facing the, the, the same challenges that Central America is, uh, is facing. Uh, and to provide uh, with our uh, capacity in terms of developing common standards for the region. Uh, and uh, also uh, a second element that we think that it's uh, indispensable in, in every uh, endeavor to success, to success is um, the need for um, judicial reform. Uh, this is a, a major element uh, to uh, ensure that institutional capacities are really uh, being strengthened. Uh, on, of course, uh, Central America has uh, uh, an enormous lack of resources, uh, but um, it will be in addition to the international cooperation that uh, everybody uh, would like to see coming in the region. Uh, we think that it's important that uh, Central America also uh, provides for its own resources 
and generates internally those resources. Of course, uh, the situation currently is uh, pretty uh, serious, and, uh, but uh, it, this is uh, one component that it will be important to, to have in mind. Uh, and it will be very important to, towards the ensuring the ownership of the strategy in Central America. Uh, with this comment, I close my, my comments, and thank you very much for your attention. Mabel. No, oh, this is very good, Mabel. I think you helped crystallize some of this and, and bring uh, the complexity of uh, cooperation across borders uh, into focus. Vicente, uh, you're on the other end of this. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, um, I took off uh, most of my talking points, so I'll be very, very brief. But um, I just wanted to start by, by bringing to your attention some news that happened about two, two to three months ago when a cocaine processing facility was discovered in, in Honduras. Uh, this uh, cocaine lab had a capacity of about eight tons uh, of uh, cocaine monthly, which is very large, but I mean, it's, it's large. And um, one thing that was uh, that that was really interesting was that the cocaine found in the Honduras lab was uh, had uh, higher levels of purity than the Colombian cocaine. And so when we started to uh, try to identify the reasons why this was the case, results that uh, because of tight legislation and tight controls in Colombia, chemical precursors are very, very controlled, so it's very difficult to acquire them. So drug traffickers are forced to use the chemical precursors and recycle them and reuse them five and six times so the cocaine they produce at the end is not of, of very high quality. Uh, on the other hand, in Honduras, because they don't have the same controls, drug traffickers have more access to chemical precursors and this is the reason why cocaine in Honduras uh, is pure produced in Honduras is pure, it has a higher level of purity than the one produced in Colombia. And this is just one of the, of the elements why we think that uh, a regional perspective, a regional approach is very important. And in Colombia we've been trying to deal with this regional approach since around seven years ago. Back in 2004, we knocked on Southern Command's door, on the US Southern Command's door, and we, and we asked them, uh, if they thought it would be a good idea to bring the defense and uh, security ministers of Central America and the Caribbean to meet and discuss what we can do, what we could do to address uh, drug trafficking and transnational organized crime. And fortunately, they, they thought it was a good idea. So we uh, went up and uh, we um, carried on. We celebrated the first Central America and uh, the Caribbean uh, meeting of ministers of defense and security that was done in Bogota. And we followed up with a meeting in Guatemala in 2006. In those meetings, we, we came up with this idea, CERCONAR it was the regional center for uh, coordination of uh, drug trafficking activities. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that didn't progress. But those were sort of the initial discussions we had uh, of how to incorporate, how to include a regional perspective in uh, the fight against drugs. Because this did not progress, we still uh, found the need to cooperate with other countries in the region. And so we did this on a bilateral uh, perspective. So for the last three years, we've been working with Honduras, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Mexico, uh, Nicaragua, and we've, we, we've started to uh, implement an approach in which we uh, jointly with, for example, uh, Honduras or Guatemala or Costa Rica, we send a team who sits down and does a joint assessment with, their, with the local authorities, the, the police or the military forces. And they decide what they need, what it is they need, what it is that the capabilities of Colombia can do for them. And we have been um, very proactive in, in that area. We have uh, 
trained already more than 10,000 police and military, both outside of Colombia and inside Colombia, mm -hmm. from Mexico, from Guatemala, from Honduras. And it's, it's, been, it's, it's had a very, very important impact. For example, in Honduras, they were having a problem with kidnapping. And uh, they thought that uh, the Colombian expertise in anti-kidnapping was useful. So we sent a team of gaulas, and in over three months, they freed about 23 hostages. They uh, they were able to to um, to catch 29 criminals, and they I think the amount of the ransom that was uh, that was uh, asked for for those hostages was around 15 million dollars. Uh, so that was uh, that was not paid. So it was uh, good for Honduras. One of the, one of the, as a matter of fact, one of the freed hostages was the cousin of President uh, Lowe. So we've had some success in, in the Dominican Republic as well. Uh, we've done some joint uh, work in terms of establishing an air bridge um, cooperation program to deny uh, the airspace to the drug traffickers, and it has been successful as well. Unfortunately, uh, we have only so many resources, and uh, and although we would want to have a higher capability, uh, we are, as you know, we still have a problem uh, in within Colombia, so we have to deal with our problem first. We're also, uh, but we're also trying to cooperate with with the region. As I mentioned, Mabel took m most of my my talking points, but. I just want to highlight some of hers. Uh, one of the messages we have tried to send continually is the importance of society coming together to fight against drug traffic. Security problems and the security issue cannot be solved only by the police or the military. It has to have the concourse of uh, the whole of the society. And that has been really evident in Colombia, uh, where not only the private sector has uh, chipped in, but the general population has seen it uh, in its uh, interest to really cooperate with the government, with the rest of the state. Uh, so not only have we done some work at the bilateral level, but we've also understood the importance of balancing the regional approach with the bilateral approach. We believe that you cannot put all your eggs into the regional strategy or in the bilateral strategy, uh, strategy but that you have to have a balance. Because uh, if you have a very strong regional strategy but the countries are weak, your results will, will be uh, uh, not very positive. And, and the same is true of, of, the, of the country. If you have very strong countries that are very weak, a regional strategy, so we we have to balance, and in that balance, we we believe that, uh, and this is supporting something Mabel said, there's a very very um, big opening for the countries to work in terms of counterintelligence, of uh, making sure that the people who are working uh, against drug traffickers really uh, have the uh, have no dark or secret interest that they are uh, working against drug trafficking. And so President Santos, in the last conference in Guatemala, uh, he made an offer. He offered to work with the, with the regional uh, strategy in three areas, basically that's money laundering and asset seizure. The other element is uh, counterintelligence. As I mentioned, he, he even went as far as to propose a lie detector center, a regional lie detector center, regional polygraph center. And another area he offered to work in was the uh, criminal database, share the criminal database. And uh, so we're working with Central America, both in the region, at the regional level and at the bilateral level. And. Uh, Finally, I want to make one, one comment about the, the, the strategy, the SICA strategy right now. And it's, it's an element that, that Mabel mentioned as well. And that's the need to coordinate, better coordinate. 
because of the situation in Central America, there's this sense of urgency that we have to achieve results fast and quick. And we indeed have to achieve results, but we cannot do this at the expense of uh, order and uh, an, an orderly and, and uh, planned strategy. And so we have to be very careful not to just uh, uh, put a lot of uh, importance in the amount of resources we give so as, as much as the need to have a really, really thoughtful strategy to counter uh, drug trafficking. Thank you very much. Vicente, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Todd, uh, you know, we're facing elections. We uh, are in a special economic situation. Uh, Congress is not uh, particularly uh, cooperative uh, uh, in a cooperative mood uh, these days, uh, and uh, it seems like just when the Central American countries are coming together to be able to, to really work together in a coordinated way and, and have help from two very powerful neighbors, um, is uh, uh, the United States about to pull the, uh, the plug on its participation, or does the United States have uh, uh, a uh, uh, plan B in these special economic times? The short answer is no. We're not pulling the plug. We're still in the fight. Um, but before I, I get there, I would just like to thank you and, and CSIS and the Council of Americas for, for putting this together. I think this is very important. I, I was pleased when I came in to see uh, a lot of old, old friends, uh, particularly former ambassador to the U.S., uh, Francisco Villagran from Guatemala, who's I think in the back somewhere. Um, he was he is a great friend, uh, not only of the United States but I think of the other countries in the region, uh, and was a, an amazing ambassador. Um, this is my 25th anniversary year in the Foreign Service, and as I looked out in the in the uh, audience, I saw uh, someone who was who is, has been um, important in my development as a career. Uh, he was my second DCM in Bogota, Colombia back in 1987, uh, Phil McLean, um, also a great friend and hopefully continues to be a great friend. Thank you for coming out. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be sitting at the table with my colleagues from uh, Mexico and uh, in Guatemala, I, I've spent almost uh, the last 12, almost 12 years, I'm sorry, <laughs> Colombia, <laughs> Colombia. <laughs> uh, I've spent almost 12 years uh, away from the United States. I'm, I've only come back uh, this last uh, July. Um, but I haven't been, I have, because of technology, I have been able to, to see the news here. And it really pained me to see uh, comments by uh, by people who who sort of um, doubted the commitment of Mexico and Colombia uh, in the fight against narcotics traffickers. Um, I think you only have to look at the news daily in Mexico and Colombia and count up the number of lives lost in both of those countries on a yearly basis uh, to understand um, just how committed they are to this, uh, to this fight um, and, and how important it is not only to those countries but to our country and to the region. Um, and I would be the first to applaud um, both of their actions and their input in the strategy and over the years in, in, uh, as, we've, as we've gone together to, to try to, to stem this tide. And their, their, their input has been important um, for a lot of reasons, but also because other countries have taken up the cause as well, largely out, take, following their lead. Um, and th I think the SICA strategy is one manifestation of that. Um, but we've also seen countries, uh, other countries in the region uh, step up. Chile is stepping up, uh, Panama is stepping up, uh, Brazil, uh, both economically, globally is stepping up and is also um, uh, playing a greater role in the region. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's really important that the, 
that the American audience realized that while they may have thought at one time this was just our fight, it's no longer just our fight. It hasn't been for many years. There are other countries out there um, with a, a great deal of expertise, and um, and I think uh, Dr. Aleman's uh, exposition on the on the strategy was um, was a great example of the contribution of all of those uh, other countries in in this uh, in this fight. The U.S. role in particular is really old school. We're not we're not doing anything new. We're not doing anything that you haven't heard before. We are doing more of it, and we're doing it probably. Uh, more smartly. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, basically reinforcing institutions. We're working with ministries of justice. We're working with uh, ministries of interior. We're working with civil society to try to, um, to bring all of those elements together. Uh, the drug fight is not just uh, law enforcement, but if you don't have good education, if you don't have jobs for people, if you don't have a political uh, environment, that allows uh, uh, debate and discourse, um, it's gonna be very hard to, uh, to fight um, a group that really doesn't care about any of those things. Um, they only care about making money and, and destroying lives. Um, we are, uh, we, when I say we, I'm using the royal we here because uh, there are any number of US agencies that are deeply involved uh, in the uh, in in our in our part in uh, fighting narcotics trafficking, um, the Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, DEA, ATF, uh, ONDCP, Department of Defense, um, and I would say um, they are both they are involved on a on a global level on an uh, interagency level here in Washington, but they're also very much involved. We very much come together as a team um, uh, at the micro level. Uh, I, my last, my previous assignment was as Deputy Chief of Mission uh, at our embassy in Guatemala. And every embassy has a law enforcement working group. And in that law enforcement working group, all of those agencies sit around the table on a weekly basis, those meetings are always chaired by the Deputy Chief of Mission, and you discuss on a weekly basis where you are on your projects, the projects that you do bilaterally with the, with, with the countries that you in, you're in, and the, and the projects that might, um, that might have a more uh, regional approach. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a huge effort to, to try to do things more efficiently more, uh, and, and, and smarter, and as was alluded to earlier, the main reason we're doing that is because everybody knows uh, res resources are scarce, and they're not going to, they're not, it's not going to get any better. Um, I'm going to say one, just one more thing, and then I, uh, I think we should, if, if we're going to do this, we're going to go to uh, questions. Um, when the, the secretary, my boss, came down to Guatemala, she, she made several different statements about uh, the different things we were doing to help fight the, um, help fight narcotics trafficking. Um, I think one of the most important statements she made uh, related to demand reduction and the, the work the United States, we in the United States have to do at home. Um, the, the simple fact is, if there is demand for this product, it's gonna get to the United States. And that's a huge problem that I think mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to wrap our minds around, we, we need to have a bigger debate on, and, uh, and we need to resolve. Um, the, my, my understanding from statistics is that the, that the demand is actually going down, um, but I think if you go to Central America, if you go to South America, and you try to uh, argue that point, uh, you're not going to fall. You're not going to get a sympathetic ear. Um, the fact is, many people we are paying for the we are paying that price, paying the price for the for this demand in the United States. I would argue today, other countries are paying a bigger price for the demand for that product, and uh, and we really need to um, wrap our minds around that. Um, I'm going to leave it there, and uh, we can go for questions. Thank you all very much.
Well, there you have it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our first question comes from Diana Negroponte. Diana Negroponte, the Brookings Institution. Two quick questions, one for Minister Gomez and the other for Minister Echandia. Um, Mabel, vetting, can you be elaborate a little bit? Is this vetting of police, is this vetting of judges, is it vetting of prosecutors? Please could you elaborate? Question for Minister Echandia. You, your, Colombia has improved its relationship with Venezuela significantly over the last year. What improvement in cooperation with Venezuela on drug trafficking has occurred. Thank you for that question, Diana. Um, and uh, since this question is too specific, I will be very concrete in responding. Uh, we are talking about vetting all institutions, all staff, judges, police, and even officials that are involved in uh, combating transnational organized crime. Okay. Thank you for the question. No, a cooperation with Venezuela on, in terms of security issues, including uh, drug trafficking, has improved over the last uh, couple of months, as you are well aware of. The Venezuelan authorities have um, captured uh, criminals that have been requested by uh, the Colombian government. They have been sent to the Colombian authorities. So um, we expect that uh, with uh, meetings between the high-level authorities of both countries, which have been, which are, have started to take place, that cooperation over the next couple of months should improve but it definitely has, has, um, has shown an improvement over the last years uh, in Colombia. David? We have a question here. Have we got a uh, microphone? Uh, Thank you, Stephen, and congrats to CSIS and the Council. We've got a great turnout today and all the speakers. A quick question for Secretary General Aleman, if you could give us a bit more detail on how the regional strategy is looking at the engagement with the private sector, both within the region and outside of the region, um, since we all know that there's been good economic growth over the past years, both internally and with external partners, free trade agreements, and so on. How, how do you envision the business community buying in and becoming partners and PPPs in this effort? Thank you. Thank you very much for, <coughs> for the question. Um, it is extremely important to involve the private sector and to realize what we call the alliances in between public, private, and social sectors. Um, the Chief, uh, the presidents in Central America um, has, uh, they disposed, they um, uh, mandated that we shall um, create a great movement of citizens against crime organized, which is means that uh, we have to involve the whole segment of societies and, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, a duty for us to generate the conditions and to create the spaces to um, uh, establish the alliances in between the public, private, and social uh, um, uh, sectors. Um, where can I see, oh, where can I look the, the alliance with the private sector? Well, in prevention, there is a big possibilities to uh, count with the private sector's role and to prevent youth, uh, to prevent uh, uh, inter uh, violence, uh, harm violences, uh, to prevent uh, uh, to re the reinsertion, um, 
etc. I, I think this is a, a very interesting uh, question and we could uh, elaborate more uh, and to respond. And um, finally, uh, let me say that uh, uh, from the General Secretariat of SICA, we are uh, trying to approach the private sector in order to um, invite them uh, and uh, to involve more active, uh, active, active in, in this uh, new crusade that we are uh, uh, doing. And the private sector is very willing to attend our invitation. Thank you. I think we have a question over here. Hi, James Bosworth, I'm a freelance writer. Um, I want to ask, uh, not just drug trafficking, but illegal, uh, illicit human trafficking is clearly a problem in the region. And thousands of Central American migrants have been kidnapped um, in Mexico, and there have been some recent incidents of, of massacres there uh, of migrants. What sort of programs are going on between Mexico and SICA for in, uh, security of migrants and information sharing, and how can you help prevent uh, this tragedy? Yes, um, in the case of m migrants, uh, we started a, a regional uh, policies. Uh, it is not mature until now, it's not uh, developed, so I cannot respond uh, from the national, each national interest perspective. In other words, uh, I cannot uh, assume any uh, response because I am in charge of the regional perspective. So um, I invite uh, our colleague from Mexico, perhaps she, she can respond. What I can tell you is that um, it's certainly uh, a major challenge for Mexico and for the region as a whole. I agree with your, with your point. Um, and we have been uh, closely collaborating with the Central American governments that are, have been affected by victims that have been killed in Mexico uh, with exchange of information, addressing the, the needs of the, of the families of the victims, uh, trying to figure out uh, where are the, the, the organizations coming from, uh, how do, do they identify uh, the likely victims, so we are closely uh, talking to the Central American governments. We are uh, trying to to, I, to exchange as much information as we can in order to, to prosecute the, the responsible criminals. Of course, the, the best protection for these people would be not having the reason to immigrate. And, and I think um, certainly Mexico, uh, but the, the Central Americans, uh, Central American countries have also looked very hard at programs, social programs within their countries um, that, that try to um, uh, create the conditions so that people don't have to leave or if they want, they leave because they want to leave, not because they have to leave. Um, the United States is, uh, and I and I can uh, talk more uh, intelligently, if you consider this intelligent, uh, talk more intelligently about uh, what was going on in, in Guatemala. But we have been in in very close contact with the government of Guatemala, working very closely with them on uh, programs uh, to uh, through AID, through the Peace Corps, um, to try to. Uh, to and and with the um, uh, the private sector to try to create conditions so that you know there are jobs for people when they graduate from school and there are schools that are worth going to to be graduated from so obviously that's the you want to you want to get as close to the problem as possible that's one of the the answers that we're that we're we're trying to offer. Uh, my name is Tom O'Keefe. I'm from 
American Store Consulting Group in uh, San Francisco, California. Um, my question is directed to um, Secretary General Aleman. Um, as a U.S. taxpayer, why should my government pay a cent for this initiative uh, when it includes countries like Guatemala that are notorious not only in Latin America but in the world as having among the lowest tax um, revenue collection records? And if that wasn't worse enough, uh, there's also a massive tax evasion. I mean, you're coming to my country to ask us to give you resources uh, at a time when we don't even have enough money to uh, properly educate our own people or provide health care. Uh, and you're asking us to give m money to a region uh, that includes among the, the biggest, wealthiest uh, tax cheats in the world. Yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, I was expe expecting, of course, <laughs> because uh, we recognize that in some of uh, uh, our countries in Central America, they, we have a, a low tax pressure Tax uh, 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 low uh, tax pressure. Um, in responding to your question, uh, first of all, we have to recognize that there exists a co-responsibility because we are n in Central America. We don't. We do not produce uh, any type of uh, of uh, cocaine. Let's say we are not a high, a big consumer. Unfortunately, we we are at a space of, of transit, part of the logistic. But unfortunately, in in that segment where the cocaine is increasing the price, because the price of cocaine in South America is one. When it's in Central America, it's another. When it gets to North America, it's another. I mean, there is a, va a value add in, 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 the, in the chain of, of prices. Um, from that perspective, I believe we, in Central America, we have to increase the, the, the taxes. We have to increase the, the um, state uh, jurisdiction, we have to uh, increase the duties of our citizen. And uh, let me tell you, there is a successful story of one of the countries in Central America recently that increased, uh, and that uh, established a new tariff, a new tax for security. Um, and I recognize that's a that's a cultural process, but we are working on it. In other words, uh, we are not with the arms like this, uh, but we are working, and there are, uh, most of the leaders in Central America are asking for it. Um, why the USA is uh, has to to share with us not only. Uh, uh, a check with, with dollars, but with technology, good practices, etc. Well, because uh, this is, on my point of view, this is part of uh, of a national security for us because it, we believe we are very close to the United States, and we believe we have we are partners, and uh, we are fighting against. Uh, narco traffic and crime organized. We are putting death people this every day. We uh, we have many uh, kills. The narco kills people in our region, and uh, those are uh, um, a legitimate consideration that I can respond. Thank you. Todd, do you want to make any comment on that? Uh, just to say that. Uh, the secretary certainly has recognized the the low uh, tax collection uh, issue. She mentioned it when she was she's mentioned it twice uh, when she's gotten to Guatemala. Um, I know she's mentioned it in El Salvador as well. Um, uh, it's it's 
you know, the, the, the central governments know they have a problem. Um, part of, the, part of the, the issue is their ability to compel people to pay taxes. Um, but they're getting better at it. We're working on it. We know it's an issue, and, and we're, we're going to try to try to get them to pay more. You know, just a, a quick comment. <clears throat> it's it's a it's a tough question, and uh, but it's a legitimate one, and uh, it's something that uh, needs to be considered. But one little factoid that's sort of related to that: uh, there's uh, one country in Central America that has a gross domestic product of about $5 billion a year, where it did, I think, in, in around, around the 2008 time frame. I'm not going to mention which one. Uh, you can go look it up. But uh, when you look at that kind of uh, uh, gross, that kind of economic activity uh, and compare that with the gross metropolitan product of, say, a uh, municipality like Lebanon, Pennsylvania, or Winston-Salem, North Carolina, it's roughly equivalent. And if you consider how many police cars and helicopters that those municipalities can buy with their uh, different uh, um, uh, budget constraints and, and different uh, salaries that they have to pay and different things they, they need to do, um, even if um, there was better tax collection in some of these countries, they don't really have the base if they were able to collect it efficiently to be able to deal with some of the the, uh, uh, the problems that are occasioned by a global um, illicit enterprise that, uh, according to the United Nations, nets something like $400 billion a year. So that's kind of what they're up against. And I agree. I think it's a fair question um, how much uh, are individual countries really contributing to this according to what they might be able to pay. And there is a lot to be done. But there is some reality in this, is that even if they did uh, put it as much into it as, as, say, we did, it still wouldn't be enough. And I think there was a question here. Yeah. Yeah. Um the political will uh, to make some of these changes. Obviously, they're, they're, these are countries with huge needs, both socially and, um, and security-wise. And um, I'm wondering if you, I, I know they're all diplomats on the podium, so analyzing the internal affairs of another country may not uh, uh, be something that you're willing to do, but both Mexico and Colombia have had to find the political will. Um, to, uh, to undertake these very expensive operations. And I wonder if you could assess where you think Central America is at, um, given they have this very low tax rate, given they have very powerful, wealthy people who, as in the United States, do not want to pay higher taxes. Uh, uh, we have a great deal of difficulty finding the political will to pay our own bills. Um, where do you think Central America is at? And what role can or should the United States uh, be playing in asking these countries, given our own <laughs> uh, economic difficulties, um, in finding the political will to pay up for, for these kinds of uh, expensive security programs when their social needs are so immensely uh, difficult. Any takers? Oh, sure. Yes, we'll get to I would say I, I would talk about the uh, the process in Colombia, and I think that for many years in Colombia, the situation was very similar. We don't have a very a very uh, high tax rate, and uh, there was no support. There was no political support for uh, for let's say the necessary authority uh, in the state. So. Um, when President Uribe came to power and uh, things started to change and, and really the highest segments of the population started to see how investing in security was really uh, beneficial for them. Uh, they were willing to pay more. So uh, I think that from, a, from what I've heard, the numbers, I, I think the number is about 90,000 members of 
private guards in, in Central America. There is a lot of money invested in private security. So I guess if there was some way in which the ordinary citizens saw the benefit in paying that resources that are uh, directed to uh, private military companies or private security companies and, uh, and they directed them to the police, the military, the judicial sector, maybe that could be uh, one of the ways. But I believe that until people, I mean, at least that wasn't the case in Colombia, even though we, s we knew, even though the situation was dire, e even though the time when people started um, to be willing to, to, to put in uh, an effort was when they were affected. When we not, not the, the lower segments of the, of the population, which are usually the, the ones that suffer the most from violence and insecurity, but when the upper mm -hmm. echelons of the of society uh, started to have to, to see that they weren't able to go to their uh, country farms because there was uh, roadblocks, and because when they saw that uh, they were losing in their in their country farms or in their uh, big farms, then they were willing to start and, and put an effort uh, to improve the security of the country in general. I would I would also say um, I I completely agree with Vicente, um, but I you know I again from my experience in in Guatemala, the middle class is also uh, uh, very cognizant of the problem and very much affected by the problem. And um, and there were there were well let me let me jump back and just say political will, uh, in my opinion from from what I've seen comes in stages. So it's not like you know uh, in a container that you pull out of the refrigerator and plop it on the table and there's my political will. Um, and and so as you saw as we saw in Colombia as the lower uh, social order began getting affected by the, the drug trafficking problem, they started screaming. In Colombia, what we saw is as the middle class started getting affected, they started looking for answers as well. And one of the things we said was, okay, what, what do you think, what do you think is going to uh, turn the tide for you? And they said, well, we don't trust the police. So we started model police precinct programs. We had two in two large cities in, uh, or, or not cities, uh, uh, suburbs of uh, Guatemala City, Villanueva and Mixco, that have completely turned around because they've gotten uh, police units in there, vetted police units, as as uh, Mabel Mabel uh, brought up. Um, they've been trained. They're on the ground. They're from the community. Uh, uh, they, they they live in the community, and that has begun to turn the tide, uh, and 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 people are starting to say, hey, it's it's worth paying for this. Same thing in El Salvador. We have a, a suburb outside of San Salvador, Lourdes, where we've done the same thing, and and it's ha it's having a great effect. Old school stuff, but it works. And if you can if you can bring your projects directly down to where people are affected and and resource them well enough so that they begin to work, then people will start paying, I think, for those services. I think we've got uh, time for about one more question and then um, in the time remaining, I'm going to ask you all to pull out your business cards and to uh, uh, get to know each other and also get to know our guests and, and talk to them personally. Um, so, gentlemen, um, the center. The friend that does provide uh, security in the U.S. for years, and this, uh, I, 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 you mentioned countries like Colombia, but I don't see Bolivia here. Number one, I think that's the genesis of the journey to come to the U.S. and Europe. Question number two is uh, there were a lot of lessons learned in the in the U.S. after 9-11, you mentioned about uh, basically new policies, new procedures. Uh, are you uh, looking for technologies that are going to automate your policies and procedures? Are you looking basically surveillance systems basically that are going to have, have an interoperability among the nations? 
Maybe that's a question for you, uh, General uh, Secretary Juan Alemán. Thank you very much for uh, the question. I um, uh, recognize this is um, a very complex uh, answer, but let me put it in this perspective. We uh, are uh, committed to face, to confront the narco traffic, the narco activities, and other type of uh, of crime, of crime organized. We are not producers of uh, drugs. We, we are not big consumers of drugs. And we, we are very small economies. Our budgets are very, very small too. Um, we are uh, considering like uh, an aggression of the crime organized in our society because they are breaking our rules because they are attempting in, against our rule of law and they are making extortion and, and they are corrupting our youth. From that perspective, we believe that the only, the only way to confront this aggression is to be very institutionalized, very strong institutionalized, very strong with uh, uh, our law, with our judiciary system, uh, to account with uh, 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 scientific laboratories to prepare the evidences and the proof, um, and of course to uh, uh, facilitate the work to our police and in the perspective of the regional effort to coordinate the effort uh, because we, in that way we maximize our resources. Um, so that's, that's in, my, in this hand. In, in the other hand, uh, we believe that uh, uh, if you control the laundry, you are gaining very much because narco traffickers are uh, utilitarians. I mean, they, they, they want to earn money because that's in, in their perspective, in their logical, is the objective, is the goals. So we have to work very, very much in uh, detect and uh, to make a surveillance uh, uh, in that area. And finally, um, our authorities recognize that the animal, what we call the animal of narcotraffics, is a big animal. And the only way to stop is to account with the alliance and the concourse of our friends, including naturally the United States, Mexico, Colombia, and the other uh, uh, allies of Central America. There is no way not to eradicate completely, but at least to control the narco activity in Central America. Thank you. Can I, can I, just, can I just add one thing? Um, and I'm probably going to cause a little bit of a stir. Um, but I, I would just say I, I think it would be a, a big mistake for uh, for my friends and colleagues in Central mm -hmm. America not to to turn a blind eye to um, the the knock-on effects to narcotics trafficking in Central America, um, including increased usage in in Central American countries and the growing production of uh, uh, heroin and the growth of poppy and the growth of um, uh, uh, coca in, uh, in, in the region. Um, it might not be in great numbers, but it is happening. It's not, uh, and, and we know it's happening. And, uh, and, and I, just, I just don't want anybody to walk away thinking it's not happening there as well. Um, if the drugs are passing through there, 
some of them are staying there. People are getting paid in kind. They're getting paid in kind through drugs. People are using the drugs. Um, you're, the, the health systems are going to suffer from that in those countries, and these are health systems that are already under strain because they, they're having a hard time uh, uh, taking care of the people that, are, that they already have. So I, I would just caution not, being, uh, not to turn a blind eye to, to a growing problem. I want to thank our guests for being with us uh, today. Secretary General Aleman from SICA, Mabel Gomez from the Embassy of Mexico, Vicente Echandia from the Colombian Embassy, and Todd Robinson from uh, the United States State Department. I think we've had a pretty good uh, view of the negotiated actions that SICA is uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, get uh, to move forward through the Central American countries. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if there is a follow-up mechanism to see how effective uh, these actions are. The outreach to other countries such as Mexico and, and Colombia uh, to help uh, is certainly a valuable contribution, as is uh, assistance on the part of uh, the, the, the biggest demand uh, uh, center, the United States. Um, and also I want to thank uh, our participants and, and guests out in the audience today. You've provided some valuable feedback that I think that uh, uh, Secretary General Aleman can take back to the SICA process. And certainly the, the question of uh, the taxes and tax base is uh, something that deserves to be um, talked about at, uh, at greater length. It's certainly good to know that uh, there are efforts like the Colombian one that uh, uh, occurred uh, earlier in the last decade to begin to look at uh, taxes uh, and contributions that uh, uh, citizens can make to take care of some of these problems. And believe me, it really hurts me to say this as a conservative. So, but we all have to pay our own way, one way or the other. Anyway, thank you so much for your contribution, your patience, and I hope you get a chance to meet these fine people up on this platform. <laughs>